Hello, welcome to the channel. This time I have a very special guest and the topic of today's conversation is going to be about developing strategic thinking skills and planning skills. You can see here Stephen. He is from China, Beijing. He's been a Go player for 20 years. Go is a strategic game. We're going to talk about it a little bit more. And he's also organized the United States Go Congress for many, many years, as well as broadcasting for European Go Congress. So although he's based in China, he's been more connected in the world than I am from this YouTube channel, which is extremely impressive. Additionally, he's also a Toastmaster, and although he's 10 years younger than me, he's already achieved the biggest distinguishment, the biggest achievement within that organization, which is the title of a Distinguished Toastmaster. This is like a black belt in karate and like nine done in Go. So it's really impressive. And this year he serves as a division director. So when a friend told me about him, I knew I needed to reach out to this learning machine and get his insights. And in our conversation, we talked about strategic skills. So you can see behind him, his uh, the Toastmaster logo and his motto for this year, which is always ahead. And Stephen is going to talk to us about developing strategic skills. Welcome to this channel, Stephen. And Tell us your story about the skills that you find the most important. Good talk, Marika. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be on this channel. And thank you for including the voice of a fellow Go player and Toastmaster uh, on your channel. These things are truly rare. We seldom find an intersection between these two communities. But here I am sharing those experiences with you. So thank you for your introduction as well. My name is Stephen Hu, and I come from Beijing, as you've mentioned. And I have been a Go player for more than 20 years, and I have been a Toastmaster for two years and a half now. So it's become a really exciting part of my life journey. And so far, I think it's been going pretty great. That was really great. You know, two and a half years at Toastmaster. I think I, my journey is five. I know I shouldn't compare, but I feel like, you know, I need to aim for the distinguished Toastmasters. Now I got to know you. You know, when we were talking about these two aspects, right? Being a Go player and being a Toastmaster, they have something in common, which is the strategic planning, the, the will to be always ahead. Maybe you can tell us a little bit what that means for you. Yes, thank you very much. Well, speaking, first of all, of the, the elephant in the room, there have been many people who have probably completed the Distinguished Toastmaster honor. Some have done it younger than I have, according to the record books. And so I'm just lucky to be one of these people picking up on um, the plaque and, of course, the pin that comes with that honor. Thank you for mentioning it, though. <laughs> and as for always ahead, you can see it in my virtual background. I don't have a great wall set up, so this is what I come up with. Sometimes you can't see my ears, but that's fine. One of the oddities of having a Zoom virtual background anyway. Always Ahead is actually the slogan I have put for my division. As Marika has introduced, I am actually a division director in Toastmasters. And if you're familiar with the organizational structure of this work of this community, basically every division will have 20 to 22 clubs. In my case, I have 22 clubs sparsely situated throughout the city of Beijing. And it's not easy to manage everything because all the clubs are very different. They have diverse backgrounds and some have different languages. Some meet on weekdays, some meet on weekends, and some are bilingual, but some only meet in English. Some meet in a company while others meet in a community. So managing everything is not easy, but I believe that even though the distant future is hard for all of us to grasp, just like in the game of Go, it's difficult for us to understand what's going to happen in the next 50 moves because that belongs to the distant future. What we can do is we can still be always ahead with the near future because most people can figure out what they're doing today or tomorrow or what happens in the next week. And if we can have a firm grasp of what we're going to do there, then we can still stay always ahead of the challenges that lie ahead of us. So this is sort of the idea that I want to propagate throughout mm -hmm. my division. It doesn't guarantee success everywhere and all at once, but I hope that it can serve as a motto to many people still looking for success 
or looking for calmness and resolution in terms of chaos. Absolutely. I really love how you highlight the fact that, you know, the future is unpredictable. And in our world, that seems so turbulent. The further ahead we think, the more scary it gets. So just to narrow it down a little bit to this like areas or the more manageable time frame, I think we can really get into, into a good place of mind to make this step forward. To connect it more with this strategic planning, because of course, that's one part of it. We talked about like the three elements of strategic planning. And the first one was about the big picture. So since you already mentioned the goal, maybe you could highlight how that connects for the strategic planning uh, aspect. Oh yeah, sure. No problem. I think it'd be nice to introduce the concept of Go to our viewers here in case you're not familiar with the game. I think that the game of chess is already firmly ingrained in Western intellectual culture, but Go maybe not so much. It's become more popular throughout the years. Of course, we had the first European Go Congress in the 1950s, and we've had more than 60 European Go Congresses now, and there's quite a sizable Go population in Europe and around the world. But of course, Go has been around for a long, long time, and the main objective of this game is to surround territory. So say you're a general and you're commanding your soldiers on the board, then you would really think about the best way for your soldiers to occupy the most land, just like in the ancient times when they used to fight against all the kingdoms. So imagine a Go board as a huge grassland or a huge city. Uh, you can imagine all the lines or the rows or columns as streets. And basically the idea of Go is to see the big picture and occupy as much territory as you can. In fact, if you can obtain more territory than your opponent, then you win. Because at the end of the day, if you have more stuff than your opposing side, then you're going to be victorious, right? So that's the basic concept of Go. And I always relate this to the big picture idea in life as well. Personally, I've learned Go for 20 years, but I'm still an amateur player by and large. We are all after players, uh, and as long as we are still learning Go, we're never going to understand the full extent of what Go really is. I believe I'm only getting a grain of sand in the ocean there. But what I have understood so far, I think anyway, is that the bigger picture we have of the overall board, the more likely we're going to succeed. For example, when we first start learning Go, it's all about surviving on the board. We have stones and we figure out how to live on the board and how to capture our opponent's stones. Then we advance with that idea. So first we start with one single stone and then we start with capturing or surviving of larger groups. For your reference, we place more and more stones on the board in the game of Go. So contrary to chess, where there seem to be fewer and fewer pieces as the, as the game goes on, we actually add more stuff to the board. So this is why we have the idea of complicated large scale groups. So once we have the idea of single stone survival, we then move on to larger boards. But actually a very common theme that goes on with Go players is once they get stronger, they realize that the big picture is more important. Forget about all the trivial details or the minutia, so to speak, of what's going on they can really discard some of that irrelevant information and focus on what's important overall is that. For example, are they enclosing the important points? Are they occupying the urgent spots on the board that require immediate attention? So just like that, we get stronger. For example, when I understood in my Go journey that some, some of the things I've invested on the Go board can be sacrificable in exchange for greater good on the board, that's really when it got locked a lot stronger. I got leads ahead of my opponent there because I just realized that if I focus on the big picture, then I am always ahead of my opponent in terms of the strategy. I don't worry so much about the wins and losses in a small area anymore. It's about the big picture. Conversely speaking, in the real world, we can also think about a big picture. I see that we have always a lot of information in the world nowadays, and we are bombarded with all kinds of stuff everywhere, all the time. I don't know about the culture in Europe, at least in China, we have 
the rise of short videos like TikTok, mm. which really is a great time killer because there's a lot of fun stuff out there. But then it adds to all the trivial stuff we deal with every day because if we consume these bits of information which are not important and don't contribute to our life on a larger scale, then we miss what's really going on in the big picture. It's not just about short videos as well. Obviously, we're dealing with lots of things every day. We have work, we have personal life, we have relationships. And a lot of that comes down to the nitty gritty details of what we have to go through every day. And it's easy to lose ourselves in the small picture and worry about Oh, what's really gonna happen? Am I gonna navigate throughout my day all right? But the really important thing is, for instance, am I happy? Am I enjoying my life? Am I achieving my goals at a large scale? Forget about the small details of what of what happened and what didn't happen or what could have happened. Focus on the general direction and focus on the big picture. It's the same thing in the Toastmaster Club, really. For example, none of our meetings are perfect because we're run by volunteers. And more often than now, we seem to miss out on the small details because it's almost impossible for us to get everything perfect. I'm sure that after every meeting, you've felt this way that, ah, if I just did this, it would have been so much better. But actually, the big picture is people are having fun and people are enjoying themselves and people are growing. So that's another example of how to utilize the big picture idea and extract what I have learned from Go or what we have learned from Go and apply it in our real life. And if we apply the big picture, then we're going to be much happier. We're going to focus more on what's really important and we're going to be a more fruitful person overall. Hmm. I think, you know, when I'm listening to you, I'm also reflecting on my own journey and of course Go as well. And when you said that we just have grasped like the, the sand in the ocean, I also feel like similar, but it only with, with time. I managed to, you know, move away from just placing my stones next to the opponent's stones just because they started in that corner, but really looking at the overall board. And it's always amazes me at this bigger professional games where the players take so much time to figure out what to do in the beginning when there is not so many things happening yet where you would think like the board is empty, you can do whatever. But this is exactly where they start reflecting <laughs> quite a lot about like trying to predict some different scenarios and kind of come up with this big picture plan for themselves. And I feel like whenever they think longer, it's because they need to reconsider this big picture, I think. This is how, how, how I perceive it. But so we have the first element of the strategic planning, which is the big picture. So what's yeah. next? Well, it, it's complementing the big picture idea because you, you can't always have the big picture and not realize your concrete goals and dreams. You, you need the small steps as well. So the second thing I would say is to plan small steps ahead. This really <laughs> correlates with, with my slogan, right? Always ahead. When mm -hmm. I'm talking about being always ahead, I, of course, I don't mean having perfect 2020 vision and planning out 50 moves ahead. I mean, probably someone can do it, but not for me personally. I'm an amateur player by and large. And in Go as well as in real life, I'm sure there are people with a with a broader vision that who can think farther ahead than myself. But what I'm advocating is if we plan the small steps ahead, then we can already predict the foreseeable future. And that I believe is achievable from everyone. For example, uh, when I was trying to teach my students, I have some kids sometimes and they are there to learn Go. And of course, being the teacher, I was like, I'm the teacher, right? I, I gotta play good. I always think of not holding back as a symbol of respect for my students. I always try to play my best. And sometimes the game would finish because I would read out the sequence that they cannot. And then I predict what's going to happen in the foreseeable future from my point of view anyway, and then win the game. Then afterwards, when we review that game, we'll say that, did you see what was going to happen after this move? And they'll think about it and they will not understand what really was going to happen. But I would then point out what I was reading ahead of their thinking. For example, it's maybe it's only five moves or 10 moves ahead. But in my foreseeable future, I already saw through what was going to happen. And so even though this was not foreseeable for them, this was what I could teach to my students. By planning more small steps ahead, I'm able to 
read out what might possibly happen and plan myself accordingly. You're familiar with this idea. In Go, there's a lot of reading involved and there's a lot of calculations because more often than not, we get into these complicated fights on the board, figuratively, not literally. <laughs> but uh, when we get into a fight like that, then we have to read out plan A and plan B and plan C. For example, we have an ideal plan of what might happen if everything goes well. We may have a secondary plan of, okay, if something doesn't go exactly according to the plan, then we have a secondary backup option. But then we have an, a plan for Armageddon. What if all hell breaks loose? We still have a baseline we can hold on to. So that, that's plan C or plan D, even plan Z. Some people call it plan Z. And the more you think ahead, the more you're able to plan out all these small steps. There are so many examples of Toastmasters that can justify this as well. One I can think of was holding the first hybrid contest mm -hmm. in my district. For those of you who are familiar with Toastmasters, you might know that we have speech contests every year. But last year was truly the first program year when we had people speaking in person in a venue and people who also spoke online in a virtual setup. And so that wasn't easy because we've never done with that. We've, we've never done that before. And people have never dealt with similar circumstances and no one knew what was going to really happen. We, we only had three or four months to figure this out as volunteers. But as you know, Marika, we don't, we're not talking about a lot of time here when we have a volunteer-based team. Even three months or four months can be inadequate. So what we did instead was we focused on the small steps of what we had to do first that was most important. For example, finding a venue, because here in China, finding a venue is a suitable venue with good network and good audio solutions is not easy. And then we figure out the second step, which is finding the right people, because it might take longer to train all the leaders we might need, all the volunteers, all the roles we might require for the speech contests. And then it was about getting all the contestants ready and briefing them and getting all the documents ahead of time. And finally, it was about execution. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff going on there. But actually, we took a lot of steps. We planned these small steps ahead. And only by doing so were we able to navigate through all the difficulties and eventually carry out the first successful hybrid speech contest in our district, in our District 88. It's the same thing for my division club officer training as well. I had to plan my project four or five weeks ahead. But you see the power of building the small steps ahead of time. Once you do that in advance, you're going to be a very powerful person because it's like in Go, if you can see through the plan Bs and plan Cs, you're going to be a very formidable player because then no unpredictable outcome or consequence will shake your belief or understanding that things will carry will be carried out successfully. Mm -hmm. I really love how you, you know, combine this shift in focus from big picture to small steps ahead to real life stories and experiences and real life projects as well because like I could relate so much when you mentioned this organizing of hybrid contest it's basically <laughs> a big picture you have an idea uh, in my case it was when I was the president of the Innsbruck club and wanted to bring the bigger stage to the club and organize a club contest in a proper venue in Innsbruck and you know it was in the middle of COVID where it felt like as if you were playing Go and or chess and you read these scenarios like 10 moves ahead and then your opponent plays some surprise and then you feel like, now I'm screwed. But from any situation, of course, you can create a new scenario to get to this big picture again, like just to navigate a little bit with more, yeah, with small steps, with a little bit of creativity. Like, oh, yeah, know. all these all these memories of speech contests are flashing before your eyes now, right? It's, <laughs> it's playing like a movie in front of you. <laughs> I think if there, if anyone has ever volunteered for Toastmasters or any nonprofit organization, they'll realize this because mm. I mean, or even if you work for a company on a on a paid project, it, it's like that. It, it takes a lot of time and effort to really bring a dream to reality. And of course, when you're talking about speech contests or club meetings or making an event your adversary your opponent is reality right mm -hmm. and the reality is always changing things are very dynamic and in fact we're probably more dynamic than ever that's why we have so many hybrid meetings because we want to hide we want to accommodate the people who have to resort to dynamic planning 
to be very flexible. So in reality, you're you're playing a game of Go against what's really happening, right? For example, all these sudden changes in the menu, in terms of people, and in terms of yourself. You have all these ups and downs. It's like an emotional roller coaster. And sometimes you have to suffer a little bit. <laughs> I mean, as volunteers, they always suffer, right? But what people may have not realized is that from all this suffering, okay, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not advocating ad- actually for suffering because I, I, I prefer joy over suffering right <laughs> but even from those good. moments of difficulty you realize the importance of building these skills to always plan ahead mm. and one of these days if you become really successful for example you hold a speech contest and it goes very swiftly but without a glitch you're going to be very thankful for all these opportunities you, you took on when you were not ready and you didn't know what to do and when things were not up to scratch. And when you had all these difficulties that made you want to quit, you're going to be very thankful for those experiences. Just like in Go, we eventually win a lot of games. When we get to a decent level, we start winning more and more. But until then, we're going to have to endure a lot of losses and challenges that we have to overcome along the way. You know, Go is not like video games where you always get rewarded for your efforts no matter what. Sometimes you have to overcome these hurdles and difficulties and emotional barriers to get past the the challenges and to overcome yourself. But it's a really beautiful thing when you get there, isn't it? I'm not sure if I'm there, so I'm not sure if I can say it, but you know, one picture or like one memory that jumped to my mind as I'm listening to you is actually when I was in China, it was World Mind Sport Games there. And I remember like there were multiple tournaments. So there was a Euro, like a uh, female championship and also the team um, championship. And in this team championship, I remember vividly, very clear game where I kind of like I was um, so emotionally invested in this game because I was playing <laughs> with an ex-girlfriend of a colleague or a friend. And I kind of wanted to get revenge on her just because of what she did to my friend. Like this is a really weird story, you know. And <laughs> Under the time pressure, like, you know, towards the end, when you run out of time, it's similarly to chess. When you when your time is up, you just might have like 20 seconds per move to really calculate your best scenario to finish the game. And under this time pressure, and with all this feeling like, oh, I have to win this game because it's uh... like, I'm doing my friend a favor. No, I was thinking, thinking, thinking. And then I decided not to protect a very crucial uh, risk. Um, because I thought the game was very close. And if I did that, I would lose by like half a point. So I didn't do this. And of course, this risk was like a standard cut, you know, standard scenario under like in good emotional state and without time pressure, you would look at it and you would be 100% sure that you have to protect this specific area. But under like this emotion and the time pressure and stress, I was like reading, reading, reading. And then finally I thought like, okay, I'm going to take the risk. And I, I can tell you that after this game, then I went out of the room, took with my plush mascot, threw it against the wall. I was so angry because I lost in the craziest possible way. So this is just like, you know, one uh, one experience that I had in how much emotion can impact the the game, basically, <laughs> the reaction. Uh, yeah, we've all been there. We've all done a nuclear decision or two. We've all flipped the board and uh, rage quit. <laughs> <laughs> but would, would you say, like, you know, my question to you is like, would you say that developing this kind of, you know, inner peace or some kind of like managing emotions better is also a part of excelling at strategic planning or developing those skills? Well, that was actually going to be my third point. Uh, inner peace is very important. Just now we mentioned looking at the problem and planning strategically from two different scopes. One, based on the overall picture. And two, based on the small steps, we can incrementally plan to get ahead by not being super ahead, but being a little bit ahead Mm -hmm. and being comfortably ahead so that we can adjust our plans according to the challenges that we have faced. But the third part about all this is going to be, of course, it's going to be related to emotions because we're not machines. We're not just an event planner. We're not, we're not a piece of software. We are emotional human beings with ups and, ups and downs with any job or volunteer work 
or any game of Go, there's always going to be this emotional roller coaster, right? Because at one point you feel like you're doing so well, uh, then you reach this valley of despair that you just feel like nothing's ever going to happen and you're ready to quit, you're ready to give up. Um, so it happens all the time. But inner peace, just like what's being said in Kung Fu Panda, great movie, by the way, oh. <laughs> is, uh, they're so, it's so important. I was actually translating for a nine time professional in China. Well, actually at a European Go Congress anyway, this year I was in Leipzig, Germany, and he was giving a talk based on this topic. And I was very lucky to be the translator. So I really read through the material very well because I was the translator. But what he talked about really resonated with me on a very deep level. And I've seen this firsthand. This year, I actually went to Europe just a few weeks ago and I was the commentator for the European Go Championship. For those of you who don't know, it's the most prestigious Go tournament in all of Europe. Because everyone would love to walk around on the street being called a European Go champion. And from what I witnessed firsthand, the players who can manage their emotions, especially their frustrations in their games, will have the last laugh in their matches. Because at the top level, everyone's pretty good. All the top European players are capable of beating each other. And if you look at their mathematical head-to-head records, they have actually beaten each other before. But it's all about who performs the best on their day. And a really important part of performing to our best level is keeping our emotions in check. And that means we must discard any unnecessary thoughts related to winning or losing or sometimes the consequences of the result. Just like myself, I'm not a perfect Go player. So no matter how hard I try, and how many hours of study go every day, I always seem to be imperfect. And there, al- there always seems to be some kind of inadequacy in the moves that I play. And so if I focus on the results, then I'm going to be very miserable. The same thing with Toastmasters. If you only focus on the DCP points, on the number of scheduled prepared speeches from every meeting, oh, well, we've all been there. That's a, that's a big one. Also, the number of members we have after every renewal period, then we're going to be miserable because we're focusing on the results. And the numbers drive us crazy because it's never going to be perfect. By the way, with the fashion that Toastmasters is set up as a volunteer-based organization, you're going to realize that we have different people every single term. We have people who are experienced and those who are not. And we have folks with different leadership and communication styles. We have people who have just joined the club and whose involvement might change due to their shifting work or life dynamic or the city they live in. Both of us have moved many times throughout our lives. I have also moved to many places in Europe and North America and also in Southeast Asia. So that changes a lot. And if we focus on the results, it's going to be very hard to nail down exactly what we're going for. But if instead we aim for inner peace in the process, then we're going to feel a very whole person. Just like when Po in Kung Fu Panda was searching for that secret scroll his Shifu sent to him, eventually he discovered that the scroll itself was empty. You see, when he was looking for the results, he didn't end up getting what he wanted and he felt disappointed because how could a scroll be possibly empty? But then from that process, he became from a very tumultuous character to someone with actual inner peace. At the very end, he finally became comfortable with who he was. And he managed to solve all those struggles he had on his journey to becoming a Kung Fu master. I don't have the full plot there. I'm going to have to rewatch the movie. Now <laughs> I'm tempted to rewatch anyway. it too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, managing emotion is so important. Back to that example I was talking about in the European Go Congress in Leipzig. I was translating for a nine-time professional player from China. And he was talking about managing his emotions when he was playing against one of the strongest players in the world at the time, Li Chang Ho, who was known as a stone Buddha. His face doesn't even change when people are playing him. It's so scary that you immediately feel upon a bout of self-reflection that probably you've done something wrong. So just like that, this Chinese pro, Xie He, a nine-time professional, defeated Li Chang Ho by keeping his emotions in check, even in the most important moments when he thought he was going to win. And even when he made a blunder towards the end of the game and realizing he was probably going to lose, 
Anyway, he kept inner peace in his mind. And it's not something you see outwardly in our everyday life. People don't walk up to you on the street and say, hey, look at me, I've got inner peace now. But it's something that we should have, in my opinion. It's a very important quality to have in our repertoire when we are planning ourselves strategically. If we have inner peace, then we can always be calm and reasonable with all the ups and downs we might have. One of the things I realized in my journey to Europe was when I talked to fellow air directors like yourself or others I've met along the journey, I realized that we've all gone through many struggles in our life journey, but that's okay. First of all, we're not the only ones experiencing them in case you're worried about your Toastmasters club not doing well. Everyone experiences the same thing. Trouble with venue, with the hybrid format, and of course with people leaving and joining and all the instability. But first of all, it's very common. In the big picture, it's a global issue. And second, ups and downs are really part of our life. And if we really look at the way our life is designed, we should focus more on retaining inner peace in the process, in the journey of what we go through, rather than the temporary results we achieve. Because we're never going to be the strongest go player ever. We're never going to have the best club in the history of the world ever. And we're never going to be perfect. But if we focus on the journey instead, then I think it will really complete our full picture of strategic planning and it will really make us a happy person. Thank you so much for sharing that because my idea with this channel as well, like mastery music, you know, mastery sounds like something that you either have or not, or like something that you want to obtain so hard. But my whole idea is to like inspire people to define, first of all, what does the mastery mean for them and really enjoy the pursuit of it because this is the, like it's something like some kind of weird destination that we feel fascinated about. But it's all about this journey and like the steps that we discussed today about strategic planning, like, you know, having the big picture and kind of translating that to the small steps and being able to to shift the focus and then having the inner peace or striving for it in order to actually really be able to do that and not just give up or pursue, you know, something that is a distraction just because of some emotional reaction we have. This, I feel like it really is a big contribution to, to what I'm trying to do here. And it kind of brings us <laughs> a full circle uh, in, the, you know, what does it really require to be great at, uh, you know, leading your life strategically and being always ahead, like, like your slogan says. Yes, actually, that's the reason I ran for the position of the division director, the always ahead slogan. I didn't do it for the fame because obviously you don't get recognized on the street when you're a division director. <laughs> Only at a, a Toastmasters meeting in Europe, maybe when people see your pin and they go like, wow, you have that pin? That's really cool. But that's probably the most you get. <laughs> and also it's not about the prestige because as volunteers, we have to deal with a lot of things. And being a leader or a supporter of 22 different clubs in one city you have to be a vessel for everyone's struggles because people will open themselves up to you, whether they're a member or a club leader or an area director or someone in the division council. So it's not easy. And I didn't do it for ease of mind. It never was going to be a breeze at all. In fact, I fully understood what was going to happen in the next upcoming year. But still, I ran for this position, not in terms of honor or in terms of prestige, but because of this ideology that mm -hmm. I want to make popular across the entire division, always ahead. Like I said, it's really helped me out tremendously throughout my life. I've been in volunteer-based organizations for nine, I think almost 10 years now. It's almost been a decade, which is quite amazing. And I've been a goal player for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. And looking back on this journey, it took me a long time to figure out how to be always ahead. Even if I'm not 50 moves ahead, I finally figured out the way to stay ahead of the challenge and mm -hmm. to have this skill called strategic planning. So I would really love more clubs in my division, certainly, to bring this kind of energy, this kind of motivation 
to the daily club meetings, to their personal life, and to their work. Because I've seen firsthand how planning ahead, having the big picture, planning small steps ahead, and of course having inner peace in mind as we go through the ups and downs can help. Some of the clubs in my division are already doing it, and as such, they have been reaping the benefits. They have more new members. And of course, as club leaders who contribute a lot of time to what they're doing, they receive a lot of joy and more clarity in their life. Despite times of chaos and turbulence, as you mentioned at the very beginning of this show, I believe that this is so important for all of us in times of difficulty and chaos and seemingly endless entropy. And I take this as the central message I want to share with all of you today. Thank you so much. That's all from us today. Unless, Steven, you want to add anything else? Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. And please always stay ahead. Stay always ahead. Absolutely.